then to Acts chapter 2 and this text that we read earlier from verse 22 onwards. Many of you will know the, the name Mark Twain, famous American author. He once went up to the minister after a Sunday sermon and said to him, everything that you said today, every word you said I've got in a book at home. And the minister said, it's impossible, I, I wrote the sermon myself. He said, every word is in a book I've got at home. Well, the minister said, well, I'd, I'd really like to see that book. And Twain said, well, I'll, I'll make sure it comes around. Next morning, package arrived inside, dictionary. <laughs> And it came with a note. And the note said, words. Just words. It's tragic when we have such a wonderful Savior to preach that some sermons are just words. It wasn't the case when Peter preached at Pentecost. By the time we get to verse 22, Peter has answered the question of the crowd when they ask, what does this mean? It's what we thought about last week. This is what was prophesied by Joel. And now we get to the heart of what he has to say to these people. And so he begins by sharpening their focus. Men of Israel, hear these words. Everything Peter said has been really important so far, but now he's saying, Pay extra attention. Listen now. Men of Israel, this is for you. Switch on. Don't miss this. As we've been looking through um, Peter's sermon, I've taken the opportunity to explore some of the lessons that we can take from this sermon about how to preach sermons and what we should expect from preaching. Uh, one thing that we identified at our recent AGM is that we need to be equipping uh, future leaders for the church. And one thing that future elders need to be able to do is they must be competent to teach. That's one of the qualifications. And so what we're going to be doing from October, God willing, is working with some of the men and some of the younger men to, to try and um, prepare them for leadership and this sermon this precedential sermon in that it's the first sermon in the history of the church gives us an opportunity to say well what does Peter do here and I want to show you a few more things tonight so if you're somebody who preaches all the pressures on Hayden this evening um, and maybe some of the other men as well but if you're somebody who preaches there are lessons for us to take and even if you don't have a responsibility for preaching maybe this is why Josh ducked out tonight Vicky and you can have an extra go for him um, maybe he knew what was coming up somebody had told him from this morning service but even if you don't have a responsibility for preaching, well, we need to know what our standards are, what we expect for preaching at Wyndham Evangelical Church. And so I want you to see four F's tonight. And the first is the flow of Peter's sermon. And we're going to see this a lot more clearly as we make our way through the passage. But for now, I just want you to notice that the Peter's sermon follows a clear structure. A structure to what he's saying. And so he begins with three words, Jesus of Nazareth. Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth. So everybody knows right from the get-go exactly what Peter's talking about. And then he's going to talk about Jesus and make a case that Jesus is not just some failed revolutionary, but he was special. That's the statement that he makes. First of all, verse 22 to 23, he was attested to you by God. That word means displayed or, or proven, shown to you all as the real deal. And so Peter is saying that God proved to the nation of Israel that Jesus was more than just a man. And he did that through all the mighty works and wonders that Jesus did. And Peter also says, I don't have to remind you what they are. I don't have to go through and, and tell you that Jesus healed the sick and restored sight to the blind and exercised demons and raised the dead because he did it all in your midst. In other words, either you were there and you saw it or you've just come into Jerusalem and you've heard the gossip going around town and you've heard about all the amazing things from your friends and relatives as you caught up on the news, all the amazing things that Jesus did. God worked through Jesus to show Israel this is God's man. 
So Peter begins with this news. This is what he's talking about. Jesus is special. Then verse 23 comes an accusation. This is the next step in the flow of what he's saying. Verse 23, this man who is God's man, you delivered up, or he was delivered up according to God's definite and fore plan and foreknowledge. You crucified and killed him by the hands of lawless men. You handed over to godless men this man, God's man, and they crucified him. You who claim to be God's people, you took God's man, you put him in the hands of pagan Romans, and you allowed him to be crucified, nailed to a cross. Now that would have stung the heart of the Jews. Because they knew that Israel, their country, had a track record of doing this. Remember, Jesus once looked over Jerusalem and said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who murder the prophets and kill those sent to you. Jerusalem had a tragic reputation for failing to recognize the men who God sent to speak to her. And now Peter's saying, you've done it again. But worse, this is not just some prophet that God has sent to you. This is the Messiah. This is the one our nation has been looking forward to for the whole of time. This is the one Israel's waited for. This is the one God has sent for our salvation and we've murdered him. And then in comes Peter with this massive surprise. But, verse 24, God's raised him from the dead. God's not going to allow your wickedness to go unchecked. But he's resurrected Jesus from the dead. And then more than that, he's taken him up to heaven. You notice in verse, um, let me find it, verse A little bit further on. So in verse 30, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here, but verse 30 and 30, 31 and 32, there's two risings that happen. So verse 31, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ. So there's this first rising. And then in verse 32, there's the second rising. God raised him up and we're all witnesses of this. This time, Peter's talking about the ascension of the Lord Jesus into heaven. So there's the resurrection and then the ascension. We'll get onto that in a little bit. But Peter's making this, this revolutionary claim that God has raised Jesus from the dead and that if, if it stung their hearts to know that their nation had put the Messiah to death this must break them because they've been complicit in the murder of God's chosen one who Peter goes on to say God has raised not just from the dead not just up into heaven but to his right hand now if this is the chosen one of God and they've murdered him they've made themselves enemies of God objects of his wrath and so you can see this clear structure and it's going to continue. There's this statement, Jesus is special, an accusation, you've crucified him. The surprise, God has raised him from the dead. The evidence then comes in, verse 25 to 35, and then there's a consequence in 36 to 41, where the people cry out, then what do we do? Brothers, what do we do? There's this flow to everything that Peter's saying. It's direction. Destination. It's like a, a river that follows a course. And our preaching needs to be like that too. If a man stands up at the front of church and says, I've just got a, a few thoughts on today's passage, uh, explaining a, a few ideas, that's not a preacher. Teaching from the Bible alone is not preaching. And this is important because hundreds of churches have lecturers and teachers and commentators and counsellors, but not preachers. See, a few thoughts on a passage, they're like puddles of water on the path outside. Stagnating pools. A sermon is a moving, living body of water. And, and some sermons, maybe not like this one so far, but some of them are straight as a canal. And some of them meander like a mountain stream. But they have a source, which is Christ. And a course, there's a channel, a thrust, a goal, which is the heart of the hearers. Now what we're going to do as we work through this is pad that out a little bit more. And so the second F I want you to see is the foundation of Peter's sermon. And I'm looking now at verse 25 to 35. You've seen those movies when a lawyer is convinced he's got a watertight case and, and he presents one specific piece of evidence and he'll just say to the judge, it's all here, Your Honor. You know, I've got it all here and, and that's it. He doesn't need to appeal to any other witnesses, any other evidence because everything he's arguing is attested to by one piece of evidence. 
Peter tells the, the crowd, Jesus is the Messiah. And he tells them this heartbreaking news, you've crucified him. But God has raised him from the dead. Now that's a phenomenal claim. And Peter's not afraid to make that claim because he's got all the evidence. He's got a watertight case. He says, everything is here. He says, think about what God has said in the past. It's all there for you to see. Now, I could preach a sermon and I could argue for the existence of God from the, the beauty and the complexity of creation. Or I could talk with somebody over the table and insist that there's a God from the objective reality of good or evil. You, you might use your own personal testimony to share Jesus with somebody. And that can be a powerful way to do that. But, but it's not what we rely on for somebody to come to saving faith. Our faith ultimately rests not on those things, not on our clever arguments, not on our personal witness, but on God's Word. Because this is not just a book, but it's God's book. It's the sword that the Holy Spirit uses to wound men with conviction and then draw them to saving faith in the Lord Jesus. And, and Peter knows that. So his sermon rests squarely on Scripture. And he uses it powerfully. He says, we've got that little quote in the middle after verse 25. He says in verse 25, look at what David says. For David says concerning him, every Jew knew who David was. They were in David's capital city. He's the greatest king, the greatest man that Israel ever produced. And Peter says, think about what our hero said in Psalm 16. And then he quotes Psalm 16 there for us. And particularly pay attention to verse 27 because this is what Peter's going to mention in a moment. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. Verse 29, Peter says, but David did see corruption. Uh, and nobody doubts it because look over there. It's, P it's David's tomb. And we can open it up and we can look at his bones and we can see the corruption that David endured. But David wasn't speaking about himself in Psalm 16. David is speaking about David's greatest son. He's speaking about the descendant that God had promised to rule forever over David's kingdom. David is left in the grave, but God raised David's descendant, the Lord Jesus, from the dead. God had promised to do that. Now Jesus is raised from the dead. And after all these mighty works through which he's attested to you that the Lord Jesus is God's man, now he's risen. One greater than David has come. All the evidence points to Jesus. And you crucified him. But God wouldn't allow that evil to go on. David's bones are in the tomb. But you won't find Jesus' bones anywhere. God raised him from the dead. Verse 31. And then there's that second raising in verse 32. Jesus ascends back into heaven and Peter says we all saw it. And so there is personal testimony in Peter's sermon. But it's not the kind of personal testimony that relies on the words of one man. He's not a Joseph Smith or a Muhammad who says they have one experience that happens to only them and nobody else is around to see it and you've got to believe their words and theirs alone. Peter turns around and there are 11 men stood beside him. We all saw it. You can ask any single one of the 12 of us and we will tell you the same story and not because we practiced it, we were there. We saw Jesus rise. It's powerful personal testimony. But even that is not what Peter's argument rests on. It rests on God's word. It's so tempting, tempting in, a, in a culture where there's generally no real respect for God's word to rely on clever arguments and rely on personal experience. But whenever we appeal to men, when we, when we will them and preach for them to believe on the Lord Jesus, this is where we go. We say, if you doubt it, it's all here. It's all here. The case is watertight. It's all here, Your Honour. Look at the evidence. Oh, those, those personal testimonies, clever arguments, they're so flattering to self. Relying on God's word, recognising, believing it to be as he's told us it is, that double-edged sword that divides, <coughs> cuts to the soul. 
brings glory to Him. The Holy Spirit takes it, uses it for the saving of souls. The third F is the focus of Peter's sermon. And so by the time we get to verse 22, Peter has answered that question of the crowd. And he's now getting to what he really wants to say. And he begins Jesus of Nazareth. And then at the end of his sermon, verse 38, he tells everyone, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. Jesus Christ is the last word in his sermon. The first words in what he wants to say is Jesus of Nazareth. The last part is Jesus Christ. And then all through the sermon, Peter's focus is Jesus. And so the thing that Peter has to preach is not a thing, it's a person. And that person is Jesus. He has one concept to communicate. And it's Jesus. You know, nobody went home from this sermon wondering what Peter was talking about. Every Jewish dad could turn to his little boy or little girl on the way home and say, what was that man on about? And, and every single one of them could answer, he was talking about Jesus. When I was teaching, there was a, we had one staff night out um, that I remember we went right into the middle of Newcastle, big city in the UK, and we were going to this kind of like a cocktail bar. And me being a sheltered Christian boy not having a lot of experience at these kind of things and going to a university in a small town that didn't have big bars like this in an old bank old Victorian bank huge building I was kind of wowed by everything I was seeing and as we got closer I could hear somebody arguing outside and I saw there was a couple arguing with the doorman and as soon as I saw the doorman my first thought was <laughs> they're not getting in <laughs> because as big as the bank was he almost seemed to over <laughs> overshadow it this guy was huge you know his, his neck was about as thick as my waist. He was just humongous. Nobody he didn't want to get in was getting in. Those of you who are members of Wyndham Evangelical Church, you have a vital job to do for God's kingdom. And if you don't do it, this church will die the same lingering, whimpering death that we see many churches dying around us. And your job is to be a doorman. But rather than keeping anyone out, your job is to keep Jesus in. Your job is to insist, no matter who preaches here, whatever series or subject or scripture that they choose to take, you insist that the sum and the substance of that preaching focuses on and orbits around the person of Jesus Christ. Keep Jesus in the preaching. You must demand Jesus. Settle for nothing less than Jesus. Because it's not theological education. It's not motivational speaking that is the way, the truth, and the life. It's Jesus. And if it's not the way, it must be what? It must be the wrong way. It must be a dead end. If it's not the truth, it must be false. If it's not the life, it must be death. Do you want dead end, false death? No! <laughs> and so I want Jesus must have him and anybody who preaches anybody with that responsibility if you're asked to preach here one Sunday or you preach regularly you've not done your job if you've not preached Jesus must be Jesus because these people don't come for anything less than Jesus they come for the bread of life you're going to give them something else they come to marvel at the pearl of great price. They come to see the treasure that is worth giving up everything else to have. They've come to meet their saviour. Would you dare give them something else? When it comes to Jesus, anything else is always less. Don't give less. Don't offer anything but Christ. And if you preach Jesus, You've done your job as a preacher of the gospel. Peter has, has done his job as a preacher. Whatever anybody says, no matter how they react or how they respond, it doesn't take away from that. Peter has done what he's called to do. It's rumored that John Wesley, we won't be taking this approach with anybody who's wanting to be an elder at Wyndham Evangelical Church, but it's rumored that John Wesley would ask ministry candidates after they preached, was anybody converted? And if they said no, 
he would say, was anybody angry? And if they said no again, he would reject them as a candidate for ministry. Now I think there's a couple of flaws with that thinking because I think it's very easy to make people mad without preaching Jesus. There are certain things that I could, I could say. Um, very quickly, I could make a comment about politics or that Burger King's better than McDonald's and some of you would be up in arms, no doubt, because you feel passionately about those things. It's easy to make people mad without preaching the gospel. But much more importantly than that, results belong to God. Results are His work. Now we hope people will respond to the preaching. We pray on a Wednesday night. We pray before the service that, that people would respond as they hear God's word. I would rather people went away mad than unmoved, than, than apathetic. But whether they do or not, that belongs to Him. We do our job and we trust God to do His. The last F I want you to see in the fourth one is the fire of Peter's sermon. And even though I've just used it a lot, there's something that grates on me using that phrase, doing our job, when it comes to preaching because it makes it something forensic and, and sterile. But Peter's preaching isn't forensic and sterile. Peter's preaching is pointed and direct and he says things that... that Make us shudder. The things that he says, they aren't interesting factoids to grab onto if you want to. It, it comes with an authority and a, and a precision. He's not like a machine gunner who's going to spray bullets around hoping that he hits something. He's a sniper targeting his hearers' hearts because he believes this message is life and death to his listeners. And, and so he speaks to them in a way that reflects that. He doesn't insult them. He, he doesn't undermine the, the power and importance of the message by, by presenting it in a way that's take it or leave it, but he puts it right on them. Verse 23, you crucified him. You did it. Verse 36, you crucified him. He puts the death of Jesus squarely on the crowd. And he looks at them in the eye and he says, you. And we say, who is Peter to talk like this? He had deserted the Lord Jesus with all the other disciples. Worse than that, he denied him three times. How can... Peter speak this way to these people? And the answer to that question is he wouldn't dare. I mean, do you really think the man who was afraid to tell a little girl that he followed Jesus could stand up before a crowd of thousands and preach like this and say, you crucified him? Peter would never speak like that. But then it's not Peter speaking. God is speaking. And when God speaks, he doesn't speak to the air, he speaks to people. You look what happened when God speaks to these people's hearts. Verse 37. Now when they heard this, they are cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Holding these people responsible for the death of Jesus is really interesting because if you remember from the video a couple of weeks ago, the reason that a lot of these people have come to Jerusalem for this feast is because they weren't able to make it for the Passover. That means they weren't in Jerusalem when Jesus was crucified. They weren't there to cry out, free Barabbas, crucify him. And yet God now says to them, you're responsible. They weren't even there. But he says, this is on you. And rather than saying, whoa, Peter, what's this got to do with me? They respond, brothers, what do we do? They're convicted. They feel the pain in the, their heart. And part of that is because they understood something that we've lost in our culture, and that was a sense of national belonging, of, of group identity. Today, Donald Trump gets elected in America, and immediately people are shouting out, he's not my president. Yes, he is. <laughs> you know, whether you voted for him or not, he's elected. He's your president. And now Joe Biden's in and the same people who were having a go at the people who were saying he's not my president for Donald Trump are now saying exactly the same thing for Joe Biden and, and everything becomes so divisive. Uh, we, we think that we can live in a country and benefit from a country while having no responsibility to that country. The Jews didn't think like that. And their leaders, whether they liked them or not, they represented them. And they knew as well that Israel, that Jerusalem in particular, had this terrible history of murdering the men that God sent to them. And so when Peter 
points, uh, points this out in his preaching, it dawns on them that history has repeated itself yet again, but this time, worse than ever, because remember, these Jews, they'd have looked back on the past and they'd have talked about their ancestors. They thought, oh, what, they, you know, what did they do? They, they treated Isaiah so badly. What did they do to Jeremiah? How could we not have seen that these were God's men? Oh, if only God would send someone to us today, we would notice... And now here comes the Messiah and they've crucified him and they realize it as Peter's preaching. History's repeated itself and they're saying to themselves, my nation, my people, myself are responsible for the death of the Messiah. You know, after the Second World War, the American troops forced German citizens who lived around the, the death camps where, where millions of Jews were exterminated. They forced them to go and see the camps take a tour and see the horror of what was going on right under their noses. Some of them didn't have a clue. Now, they hadn't been the soldiers pouring chemicals into gas chambers. But they were still responsible. This had happened in their country. It had happened under their watch. And there are harrowing videos of well-dressed German people walking around, weeping their eyes out with broken hearts because of what they had been complicit in. Peter's preaching wounds the people's consciences. You've crucified the Messiah. He demonstrates the immeasurable value of the Lord Jesus. This is the one chosen and used by God. The one attested to you. God couldn't have made it more clear that this was his man. And you've killed him. And God wouldn't stand for it. He's resurrected him from the dead. He's raised him to his right hand. He's given him the name above every name. He's given him the position of all power and authority. And you know this. You can see it because he sent his Holy Spirit out. And you're witnesses to it. You've heard the noise of the rushing wind. You've seen people speaking languages. They would have no way of knowing otherwise. And it cuts the people to their heart. They're broken because they've made themselves enemies of God. The nation has raised its fist against God's own son. They're a broken people. And then Peter's sermon, with all that fire of conviction, ends with a new fire of hope. Because though they've participated in the murder of Jesus, Peter makes it clear that through the murder of Jesus, God is going to save anybody who will turn from their sin and believe on him. Fiery stuff. And we have to make sure our preaching has that fire. We don't preach Jesus like he's an optional extra for our lives. But he's more essential than the air that we breathe. And so we have to insist that the preaching from this pulpit is pointed and it's direct and it speaks to people rather than the notice board. Because we're not going to change if we don't see that this is for us. We're not going to give up on the sins that we love so much. We're not going to give up on self. When we love ourselves so much. We'll never do that unless we see sin's wickedness and Christ's worthiness. So we must have flowing, foundationed, focus fiery preaching makes us question and calls for a decision and puts us on the spot and asks us those awkward questions what are you going to do as a consequence of what you've heard tonight because God speaks to our lives and demands action what's going to change before you even walk out the door that's what we need that asks us like, like Joshua asked who who's it going to be choose for yourself this day who are you going to serve who are you committed to who are you living for this week and then preaching that comes with that same fiery hope oh yes we're guilty before God yes our sin is why Jesus had to die that's why Jesus died not just because of Israel's sin the, the situation is much more grim than national responsibility it's international responsibility it's sin that Jesus has to die for not just for the nation of Israel's all sin it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished 
and yet still the grace of God is so vast and the forgiveness of God so complete it's able to reach me whose sin nails God's son to the cross let's pray Father, in your mercy, please save us from getting comfortable and complacent with the gospel. Save me from getting comfortable and complacent in preaching. Help me always to see it as an incredible honor to prepare through the week to study your word and to see more of the Lord Jesus and help me always to be excited to come and preach your word that my sermons might be flowing founded on your word focused on Christ fiery because what we have to preach and to testify to is life and death Help us as a church to always have this kind of preaching. Father, we pray that any future leaders of your church and the elders now would be preaching in a way that is commensurate with the weight of the gospel and that's in keeping with the way Peter preaches here. Father, we thank you that in preaching you don't erase our personality, but the personality of the preacher still comes out. But help us to be passionate as your word is declared, that, that men and women in our little town would see that this is for them. And we long, Father, that they too would be cut to the heart that the people in Wyndham would be convicted over their sin. That you would do the work that the best preacher in the world can't do. Bring conviction. Work saving faith in hearts. Father, why don't you use our little church as a beacon to this town. And then turn Wyndham on its head. We pray it for your glory. That Jesus might be loved. That his kingdom might increase. In his name, amen.